I still have a lot of stuff I want to get through, so I'm going to skip over some stuff. Um, but you have it all in your packet, which is why I gave you the large packet, so you would have all this information. Uh, yes, these are um, advocacy skills, and I talked about them with my, my more verbal guys, how we really want to work on advocacy skills, that they advocate on their own behalf. But I also want to point out that these are all advocacy skills. Aggression, self-injury, disruption, elopement, non-compliance, obsessing, and nagging and badgering. Um, I, I have non-compliance in quotes because, again, a hallmark of being an adult. You know, and obsessing I have in quotes only because as a behavior analyst, like, the autism community has adopted that term. Anytime somebody with autism does it more than five times, they're obsessing over it. Um, and I think we started to use that as an explanatory fiction. As it, what I mean by that, once we say it's obsessing, we can't do anything about it. Like, we have to talk to psychiatrists, we have to get them medicated. As opposed to sort of understanding why they might be interested in that with such sufficient intensity that they're doing it over and over and over again, okay? Um, one thing I also want to add to much of what I was saying this morning, um, and another, you know, I talked about the, the call for behavior analysts to really start looking to the future and how do we support adults and a couple other things. But I really advocate that we move away from this high-functioning, low-functioning dichotomy. Um, it's a useless term. Um, tells me nothing about the person, uh, except maybe verbal, verbal ability. That's probably all. It, um, but it tells me nothing useful. Okay, and I have clients who have bachelor degrees who sit in their room all day and don't do anything whose functioning is actually lower than some of the guys who have quote unquote untestable IQs and that are working and have friends and like do all this. So, so it's a misleading, it doesn't mean anything. So, which is why I kept saying like classic autism versus, I don't have a good replacement, so if anybody comes up with a good replacement, you know, more and more we're getting into non-categorical discussions and what this person really needs as opposed to what their label is and that's all really good. But we still, for research purposes and funding purposes, we have these labels. But I still think as a, as a field, we can move away from using these terms that are oftentimes used pejoratively, OK? Um, the only thing I want to talk about uh, in terms of employment um, and adults, this number one thing up here that we need to redefine work readiness, and all I mean by that is that I consider work readiness that somebody is, is work ready if they're breathing. Like, that's my picture here. Okay? Like, if I meet somebody, I don't have time to say, oh, you need this prerequisite, you need that prerequisite. Like, I gotta get you out there, okay? Um, but the other thing that I just think is so important is this job match part. Now, this is sometimes referred to as con uh, goodness of fit, environmental congruence, but it, it's sort of why you do the job you do, all right? Um, Pat said this, just said before we were out in, the, in the, the ante room or whatever and said something about, the, you know, you tell people you work with autism and the first thing they say is, you must have so much patience. <laughs> and I'm like, kiss my ass, I have patience. I have no, I have no patience. That's why I'm good at what I do. I expect a lot from my staff, from my kids. Like, I don't, and then they say, oh, you must be, be such a good person. I'm like, huh. <laughs> Not even close. And then they say, oh, it must be so hard. And I'm like, no. Like, it's challenging, it's frustrating, but it's never hard. Like, I wouldn't do it for 30 years if it was hard. I love what I do. I have the coolest job in the world. Like, my job description, your job description, change somebody's life. That's it. Forget about your behavior analyst, speech path, OT. Like, that's your job description. Change somebody's life. Go home every day and say, did I make his life better? Like, that's your measure. Like, how cool is that? You know who I think has hard jobs? Accountants, I think, have hard jobs. <laughs> you know, that they get off on columns of numbers and making it come out right? Like, that's a diagnostic category to its own, you know? <laughs> I'm very thankful they exist. I can't live without them. But, you know, my, my world is this, and I love what I do. Okay? When we talk about folks on the spectrum or with any disability label, it's not about a job, but it's the right job. Okay? And oftentimes that means trying different jobs. They're called developmental jobs. None of your first jobs was your best job. But you went on to another job and another job and another job. Which is why I think we need to get away from saying job placement and talk about career development. 
Okay, once we say somebody's placed, it sort of has that finality again. You know, he's done. And one of my stupid behavior analytic um, thoughts at one point, I worked with a guy who had worked at like a 7-Eleven for four years. You know, and he did the coffee, he did all this stuff, and he was great. He's one of their best employees, he got all these awards, and four years into it, he started screwing up. Like he would like knock people over to like pick up a piece of paper and all this stuff. And the behavior analyst in me, my first inclination is, oh, we have to come in and assess the situation and, and design an instructional program and tend to reinforcement. And as we're talking about this, it dawned on me, he's been doing this for four years. Nobody does this for four years. <laughs> like, this is his way of saying, I'm bored. Get me the hell out of here. Like, we need to move on from this. And again, like, listening to him... You know, I really started to think, you know what, this is just one step in your life. And where are we going to go? And nobody works for four years at a 7-Eleven. You know, unless you own the 7-Eleven. <laughs> you know? And so it really forced me then to think, where are we going? Why is this good? What do we want to do? And how are we going to get there? Okay? But I, I just want to point out that it's, although it's our easiest one, it's really complex when we really think about the right job. And there are just multiple variables that impact this. So it's not just the individual, but it's the physical job match, the social job match, the navigation job match, family concerns, program resources, coworkers, society at large, and the employer. So it's not just about this person. It's about all of this. And it goes back to that context thing again. Okay? It's not just about a job placement. It's being included at your work. That's what we really want to talk about. You know, so there's a whole bunch of things. I'm not going to go over these. You have all of these in your packet. But these are just some of the things that we'll look at in our early discussions. The physical job match. I just want to point out, um, in working with the group of individuals that I work with, I have met only one adult in my life who really thrives on physical labor. <laughs> the rest would prefer never to have to lift a heavy box in their life. I would prefer never to have to lift a heavy box. Okay, but this one guy loves physical labor. I wouldn't have predicted it. I wouldn't have thought it. But you know what? He lo you know what the, the coolest thing is? Nonverbal. We deinstitutionalized him at age 54. Okay? So he's institutionalized at 5. We took him out at 54. Okay? Nonverbal, except when he was really mad. He'd curse you out in Spanish. Um, headbanger. <laughs> all this stuff. Got him working at a physical job. He was very, very... Um, Completion oriented, so it worked really well. What I think is most interesting about him is that we looked at quality of life stuff from, because he can't tell us, but we looked at stuff like he was getting up in the morning and dressing himself. You know? His head banging went down to zero. Now, I think there were two factors in there. One, I think, was, um, as a behavior analyst, I'm not supposed to say this, but one was just sort of, you know, cognitive emotional. That, like, he knew he was working, he knew he was doing something valued after 54 years. He was out there in the world doing something. I think that was part of it. The other part, I think, is much of his headbanging would relate to if things were out of place in the environment. And I think after working close to full days in physical stuff, he would get home and like go like, the pillow, the pillow is supposed to be, uh, hell with it. <laughs> 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 I, I really think it was like those two things put together. That So, so those things we can sort of used to assess that this was the right job at the time and the right job path. He now works for a major drug company and he's on their lawn maintenance. He has no job coach, he has nothing. He's just, the only support he gets is somebody drops him off in the morning and picks him up at night. It's all natural supports, his job, his co My favorite thing with the co-worker is at one point they wanted him to, to pull weeds, to learn to pull weeds. And again, he ran us to me. I'm like, oh, we have to come up with discrimination. Like, this is a weed, this is not a weed. Touch weed, good touching weed. Which is a whole different <laughs> teaching program. You know? You know? <laughs> but one of his co-workers took a spray bottle, filled it with water, put blue food dye in it, and put, like, flour in it and shook it up and then sprayed the weeds that he had to pick blue. And the flour was in there so it would stick to the weed. So what he learned was just to pull the stuff that had... The, and I'm like... I would have thought of that. <laughs> like, never. <laughs> so, 
social maps, like the social interactions, are they positive, are they not positive, are they heavy, are they not? Navigation match, family concerns, program resources, um, employers, this is a big one. Please, you know, you don't want employers to look at the job as a token or a favor. Like, you're doomed to fail. You are doomed to fail if you do this. Because once you set expectations low, you're going to meet those expectations and that's going to be it. Okay. Coworkers, my favorite coworker training story, and talk about teaching our guys to reinforce other people. Um, very severely involved young man. Um, if you said hi to him, you had about a 33% chance of him saying hi back. That's all. One out of three times he'd respond. Okay. Gave a job working in a fairly busy office. Okay. We train his coworkers and we say, please, 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 say hi to him when you see him. Because we want him to be socially included, not just like physically working there. We want him to really be part of it. Um, because like, he may not say hi to you, but, but he really likes it if you say hi. So please do it. And if we don't train the coworkers, they say hi to him once, he doesn't say hi back, and what happens? It stops. That's it. That is one of those skills that we expect high rates of reinforcement for. Okay? So it stops there. All right? So now we train all these people. I come back like a month later, and what I see are people walking past this guy going, John, how you doing, man? Good to see you. Two minutes later, coming back, John, long time no see, pal. How are you, man? Like, <laughs> like everybody. And I, I asked his job, I said, what's going on? Like, why? Like, I know I'm not that good a trainer. Like, why? Without us really intending it to be, John became sort of like a social slot machine. And uh, people would go, John said hi to me today. Did he say hi to you? <laughs> yeah, he doesn't really like you. <laughs> so he would reinforce people for saying hi to him, and then they would sort of keep going. Like, I, I really think, like, he, it's still working, but I really think, like, he probably going to get to the point where he's going, like, won't you shut up? <laughs> but now he actually says hi more frequently because he's getting more practice, and... So it works, you know, it worked out really well. Um, let me jump ahead um, to the social world. I don't know if you can read that. <laughs> okay. Um, if, you, if you have never seen it, I really encourage you to go online and type into your web browser, Institute for Neurotypicality. And you will find the diagnostic criteria for neurotypical disorder there, written by somebody on the spectrum. Okay? It says, neurotypical disorder strikes one at 99 out of 100 individuals. It's expected to be a lifelong disorder. But with training and intervention, they can go on to lead productive lives. <laughs> okay? Where for autism, the diagnostic criteria, the, the diagnostic code is 299. Right? We all know 299. Um, according to this, the diagnostic code for neurotypical syndrome is 666. Yeah. <laughs> but it's set up just like DSM characteristics. Really check it out if you ever want to see how we are perceived by the people that we're supposed to be trying to help. Okay? I, I sort of mentioned this before, but social skills really are just, they're access skills. They're how we get things we want and avoid things we don't want. Okay? We're only social for a reason. Like, that's, that's what it is. Like, we want to have friends. We want something they have. We want to go out with them. Like, they're like, we're only social for a reason. So these are highly reinforced skills. And they allow us to avoid negatives by successfully manipulating the world around us. But these are really complex skills. This is, this is easily the most complex component of that triangle, those three parts, the social production and navigation. This is the most complex because these are multi-layered. These are context-bound. Saying something to one person means you can't say it to another person and you can't say it in this context and all this sort of stuff. When we talk about uh, in sexuality education, we will work with the families to teach elementary school kids with Asperger's syndrome. We will expose them to all those four letter words they're going to hear. And the reason that we do that is so that we can set up discriminations under our control about who you say these words to and who you don't. Because if we wait for him to get out of elementary school, He's going to be exposed to all these words, and what's eventually going to happen, and this happens, I, I cannot tell you how many cases I get like this, you know, and forgive me for use of this word, but uh, one of his little buddies is going to come up to him and say, see that little girl over there? Like, she likes you. Like, why don't you go up there and say, I want to touch your pussy, because she likes when guys say that. And you know what my guy's going to do? He's going to do it. And you know who's going to get in trouble? My guy. Because the kid who told him to is a liar. Okay? He's going to say, no, I told him not to say it. He said he wanted to say it, I told him not to say it. Okay? 
So we can say these are the words you're going to hear. Don't say these words. And we start, by the way, whether or not this is good or bad, because there's no data on this, there's no research, so we're kind of flying by the seat of our pants here. If we can establish that you don't use these words, then we can say, OK, now you can use these words with your reference. And then we start to do more normalized use. Um, the only exception, this is just arbitrary, that we make from the get-go, is that we say you could use the word balls. We say, because no adult male ever says scrotum. Like, you, know, <laughs> like, you want to get beat up more? Say scrotum. <laughs> like, so, that's one of those social culture things that we have to take, take into account, okay? These are just some of the challenges that some of my friends have told me about. I have Donna's here. If you want to tease up all the skills, why don't you adapt for a while? I just want someone to show me the rules. Okay, the social rules are so complex. This is my friend Tony. He was 54 when he got diagnosed. Um, this was because he got in trouble with the law because a week after his mother's funeral, um, when you hug everybody, when you offer condolences, his neighbor came over, brought food. Um, Tony thought he was supposed to hug her. She didn't want to be hugged. He hugged her anyway. Like, he didn't pick up on the signs. Um, she called the police on the sexual assault by the guy next. I just want somebody to show me the rules. Okay? Life in the community is really complex. And when we talk briefly about sexuality, please understand that all sexual behavior is social behavior. Okay? That's why this gets so confusing and why I have such a large group of adults who get in trouble. You know, because it's so easy to violate social norms. Independence is important, okay? There's little potential for distinction between who they are and their status as a person on the spectrum. My friends refer to themselves as Aspies or Audies. Um, Ari Neiman talks about, you know, like he got, we got into an argument one time because I say person with autism spectrum disorder, and he says you should say autistic because you can't separate the two. Ari's on the spectrum. I said, well, you know what, Ari? I can call you autistic then. Like, you've given me permission for you, but for anybody else, they have to give me permission. I think just like any other cultural group, like, I, I'm not part of the group, so you guys can call yourself whatever you want, but I'm an outsider. So I have other rules of how I can interact. But it's not so much knowing the skill, but using the skill. And please understand that when we teach social competencies, they have to make sense for the person. Otherwise, they're not going to use them. A very good friend of mine, Michael Alessandri, you know, probably 15 years ago, 12 years ago, published a very nice, well done article in Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis on teaching kids with autism to offer assistance to, to other people. Well done article. You know, it was like, a person would fumble with their keys, and the kid would then say, hi, can I help you? And like, the key they needed had a little color code, so the kid could identify the key. And the kids learned to do this, OK? Now, tell me, <laughs> how often is that scenario going to happen in the community? Never. OK, and tell me, does this kid then develop a desire to help someone, or is this, is this just a situation-specific skill? It's a situation-specific skill. Like, because it has no impact on his life outside of that. When you think of social skills, there's an old joke, okay, about an elderly gentleman who was 80 birth, 80th birthday party, and he'd never spoken his whole life. It's his 80th birthday party, and all his friends are there, and they're having, you know, a big celebration, and they bring out the first course, and it's soup, and he takes a sip of the soup, throws down his spoon and says, God damn it, the soup is cold. And his friend's like, what? what, 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 what you haven't spoken your whole life. Why are you speaking now? And he said, up to now, everything's been okay. <laughs> you know, if you don't have to communicate, like you're not going to. This is all of us. Okay? So now add on top of it the neurological challenge of having an autism spectrum disorder, and it's that much harder. So we have to work even harder to figure out why you want to communicate and how I can give you the skills along those lines. Okay? Increasing demands of the social world? <clears throat> well, you know, the lowest is in your home. Why? Because you set the rules. You know, I don't talk about, I haven't for 20 years now talked about dysfunctional families, you know, and that's because my wife and I, who have no kids, are like the most dysfunctional family you'd ever want to meet. Like, the, every family's functional to the extent that they're functional, unless you get into, like, criminal behavior. Like, but you set the rules. Like, I have families who, when I first met them, their 20-year-old son would come home and take off all his clothes and lie on the couch and watch TV. And that was normative for them. Because that became the rule of the house. Okay? So your social skill set is your lowest when you're home. 
Next becomes school or work, but this is a huge leap. And the reason this is the next environment is because both school and work tend to be a somewhat scripted social environment. It's not really free-flowing. Like, you're not going to get surprised by a lot of stuff in those environments, okay? Next becomes the community at large. Why? Because in the community at large, you have less control. And then lastly is the world beyond your community, whether a different social circle or a different country. Chances are your social repertoire. Sometimes I think, when I describe people, lay people, what autism is, they say, imagine every single day of your life somebody picked you up and dropped you in a new country where you had no idea of the language, of the culture, of the cusp of anything. And then once you start to understand, somebody picked you up and dropped you again. And then picked you up and dropped you again. Because that's how social rules are. They change all the time. So let's talk about urinals, okay? Let's talk about the social context of urinals. These are three sets of urinals um, in which Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes is urinating. So I violated, I don't know how many copyright laws in this presentation, but this is definitely one of them, okay? Each urinal, I mean, each set of urinals is six urinals. All the guys here know this. Most of the women know this. This is not a secret anymore, right? But in the first set, Calvin's in urinal two and urinal four. Guys, which one do you pick? Six. Six. You take six. <laughs> you put as much social distance as you can between yourself and another person, okay? Next one. He's in two, four, and six. Which one do you pick? One. 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 You take one because you have a wall here, okay? Otherwise, you're buddying up with two people. We don't buddy up with two people. Okay? Last one. Someone's in one, two, three, five, and six. What do you do? Wait. You sort of hesitate. You don't really, like, stand there and go, doo, 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 you know. Like, you sort of hesitate. Like, you'll check the stall. Okay? You'll take this, but you don't want this. Okay? This Calvin, by the way, drunk. Okay? <laughs> Guys, am I right? Alcohol changes everything. <laughs> like, all of a sudden, all these rules go out the window. Okay? Now, a couple of other things you may not know about public mentions. At least the women may not know. We don't talk in men's rooms. I mean, we don't consider urinating a social event. <laughs> you know, sometimes in the snow when we're writing our name, we're doing drawings. <laughs> But still, like, it's not a social event, okay? We don't make eye contact. Like, there's no eye contact. In the you know, you just need to know where other people are. So it's like all, like, sort of peripheral sort of vision, okay? If you're at the urinal, there is one appropriate place to look, and that is straight ahead. Yes, you really are supposed to look down, but if you do look down, you look straight down. You don't like glance left or right. Okay? That's considered a faux pas. Okay? To do that sort of thing. Now, all the guys here know this. But also, I'm willing to bet cash money that none of your fathers at any point took you, put their arm around your shoulder and said, son, let's talk urinal placement. Okay? <laughs> You learn this, but you sort of observed and you made a mistake. Like you picked this one and these guys shifted a little bit, you know? Like we picked. It is a very idiosyncratic, weirdly asocial environment, okay? Now, cross the hall and go to a women's room, okay? Completely different world, right? I'm fascinated that they put little living rooms outside of public women's rooms, you know? And it's because. You guys, for whatever reason, consider urinating a social event. <laughs> no guy will ever get up from the table and say, I have to go to the bathroom, you want to join me? <laughs> <laughs> but you do. <laughs> you invite people along. <laughs> okay? When we talk, right? Women talk to strangers, which boggles my mind. Oh, that's a nice mess. Where'd you get that? <laughs> like, guys, you may not know this, but women do this one thing that no man will ever do. They pass stuff under the stall. <laughs> okay? Like, 
Like, if somebody asks me to pass something, I'm touching my feet and pretending I'm not there. <laughs> and if I need anything, I'll just wait until they leave and I'm getting it myself. <laughs> like, that's it. Now, why do I bring this up? You might ask. Think about it. Two rooms, each 200 square feet, each the exact same function. How completely different are the social skill demands? That's what I said before. You can't teach social skills if you don't know the context of social skills. Okay? And if you teach the social skills in a women's room to a guy, you're teaching a really bad set of skills. Okay? You can teach guy skills to a woman, they're just asocial then. Okay? But you have to know what the skill set is before you can teach it. If you arbitrarily think you know, I, I can almost guarantee at least 50% of the time you're going to be wrong. Okay? You have to get out there and figure this out. And by the way, I know all this stuff about women's rooms just because I ask a lot of questions. Okay? And one last thing about women's rooms. Guys, if you don't know this, I think it's going to be like an Olympic sport at some point because, well, you know like those the toilet seat covers, like like in the men's room, right? Like, like you could carbon date those boxes. Like, that one box has been there since 1912. Okay? But women not only use that, then they put like three layers of toilet paper over that, and then still hover half an inch above the layers of paper that they put down, thereby guaranteeing that it's going to splash back up onto the paper. Okay? It's like you're preparing for a ski jump. Like, so it's, it's, I'm just an observer of human nature. That's all. No guy would ever do that. There's a whole bunch of things we can do to teach. But it has to all be context driven. And I just want to show you this one thing that we continue to work on. And this is looking at social skills from the point of view of response efficiency and response effort. It's hard to be socially competent. It's really difficult, okay? So I stole all of this from the, the literature on emotional intelligence, which we behavior analysts don't usually read, but I always read outside my area because it's much more interesting. <laughs> um, and, so, and people looking at emotional intelligence, which is really social competence, say that social competence occurs along a continuum from social survival to true social competence. What we tend to do when we teach is we teach from a social competence point of view because that's where we are. That's our skill set. So that's what we tend to teach. But if we just use the hallway greeting, everybody knows the hallway greeting, right? You walk down the hallway, hi John, how are you? Good Peter, how are you? Okay, that's, this is a really complex little social skill. First of all, you have to process the question. You have to formulate an answer by identifying the person too. You then have to verbalize your response all within about a second and a half while you're walking down the hallway. Like, this is such a complex skill that we neurotypicals will oftentimes pre-formulate our answers before we hear the question. So somebody will say, hi, Peter, how are you? And I say, not much, you? Because I expected them to say, what's up? You know? It's much easier that way. Well, we often have tried to teach this and looking from a social competence point of view. But I was out with one of my students one time, and after lunch, we go out, and he was walking ahead of me, and he's a well-dressed 18-year-old African-American kid, and these two other kids about his age come walking around the corner, and they see him, and they go, hey, man, what's up? And all my guy did, he went, I guess he went, and kept on going. And I was like, that's it. That's all you got to do. I've been spending the last five years trying to teach you to go, hi, my name is Andy. How are you? <laughs> As opposed to just going and going on. And how much easier is it for him then to now actually complete that social interaction in an appropriate way, you know, so his response effort is very low, his response efficiency is really high, and now all of a sudden he's participating in that interaction. You know, one of the things that we're finding now, and we don't have sufficient data to really talk much about this, is that once we can master this end, it's easier for us to go this way in teaching than to go this way in teaching. So if we get you to actually learn how to sort of close the social loop, then we can add skills in. Where this way we never get to that. You know, these are, are some, these are broader ones. 
Like, I can, like, like the base minimal social skill for you to have lunch with coworkers is to eat neatly. Like, you don't have to talk, you don't have to do anything, just eat neatly. Because if you're talkative and you steal french fries and you put 14 french fries in your mouth and you have ketchup on your shirt, nobody wants to sit with you. <laughs> right? But we focus on conversation skills and all this sort of stuff. But let's look at the base minimal social skill. And then I can worry about all the rest of this stuff. Because I can also then train the neurotypicals, and we can talk about different topics, and all that sort of stuff. Does that make sense? Okay, social skills are really in that way no different than other skill sets, but we've always approached them from a very challenging point of view. A ridiculously brief discussion of the concept of leisure and social skill instruction. Um, this, I think, like I said, I think we do a very bad job of this, but the, the issue is that leisure skills, by definition, are the ultimate choice activity. They require choice in terms of activity, location, duration, time, partners, and access. Activity, location, duration, time, partners, and access. So what you do, where you do it, who you do it with, how long you do it, can you get there. Like, that's how you guys define, okay? Play and connect for, not a leisure skill. Okay, flipping through magazines, not a leisure skill. Okay, I have taken in my career, not bragging here, but I've taken at least 100 adults with autism spectrum disorders bowling at this point in my life. Why? Because bowling is the great sport of the group home. Okay? We put six people into a van and we go to the bowling alley and everybody bowls. Okay? I am not knocking bowling. Okay? I, get the, I kind of feel it's like the American version of curling, but that's all right. Okay? Which I was watching on TV last night, which is really not a TV sport. <laughs> I, I can see it from their line. It might be interesting. But. <laughs> of those hundred people, okay, I think two of them bowled. Two of them actually bowled. Like they, they kept score. They tried to get better. They did body language while they were like, like for the other ninety-eight, it was a stupid work task in somebody else's shoes. That's all it was. <laughs> Okay? Think about it. We're going to take you to this crowded, noisy place. Then we're going to make you change shoes. <laughs> then we're going to give you something really heavy to throw, which if you did under any other circumstances, is a problem. You know? <laughs> then no matter where the ball goes, we say, good job. <laughs> You arbitrarily do this ten times, and then you put your shoes back on and leave. <laughs> now, you can go bowling and use it for like turn taking and social interaction and purchasing and waiting. And there are thousands of skills you can try to do. But unless he or she gets up in the morning and says, damn, I want to go bowling, <laughs> it's not a leisure skill. Do not delude yourself that you're doing leisure skill programming, which is why I think this is the hardest thing that we have to teach. Okay? Because it, it comes down to so much individual choice. You know, a 34 year old man that I work with, his favorite thing in the world, his favorite leisure time activity, like Sesame Street videos. He loves Sesame Street videos. You know, I spent six months of my life trying to pair Sesame Street videos with other things that were more age appropriate. I got rock video, like he liked girls in bikinis, so I got like old Van Halen videos and Motley Crue videos and like all this sort of stuff. And he liked music and. and and I thought this was going to work, and at the end of six months, you know what his favorite thing in the world was? Sesame Street videos, okay? But from my point of view as a person charged with supporting him, at least now I can be comfortable that he's making a choice. Like before, I just wasn't sure if he was choosing that because he didn't know what else he could choose. But now that he's had access to other stuff and he still chooses it, I can be pretty comfortable saying, you know what? You're an adult, man. Like, I collect comic books. Like, so it's okay. You know, does that make, like, but that choice thing is so critical. Some behavioral indicators that activity is leisure rather than work may include, oh, if they ask for the activity, <laughs> they do it on their own, that's usually a good thing. They do it for a really long period of time, that tells me that they kind of like it. They don't engage in problematic behavior during it, that's also a good sign. The individual demonstrates positive affect. They go from calm to happy to joy to euphoria during the activity. I tell you, like, you think people with, with, on, the, on the spectrum like, don't have emotions? Like, you want to see pure joy? Hang out with somebody on the spectrum. 
You want to see pure depression and act, hang out with somebody because the, the social filters aren't there. Like that's pure emotion. The individual is reluctant to terminate, and this is where we behavior analysts oftentimes screw up. Okay. Because they go, oh, you know what? Like, we're not going to give it to him anymore because when we tell him he can't do it, he engages in a problematic behavior. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we have to take this away because he can't handle it. Mm -hmm. You have this highly, by definition, this highly reinforcing activity, this highly preferred activity, and then we take it away because we can't figure out how to give you the skills to handle termination. Okay? That is so wrong on so many levels. And I see it so often. I cannot tell you how many times and they say, oh, we don't let them have that anymore because. I'm like, well, that's kind of backwards, you know? It's like if you tried to interrupt me in the middle of sex and wondered why I got upset, <laughs> <laughs> and then said, well, we're not going to let you do it anymore because you can't handle coitus interruptus, <laughs> I'm going to be your most aggressive client ever. <laughs> You know, so what this person likes is so critically important to how we can support them. And speaking of that, I want to spend the last 25 minutes talking about sexuality, okay? This presentation contains language and imagery of a sexual nature that may be considered inappropriate for younger listeners. Okay, not really. But uh, I am going to talk about sex right now. We don't like talking about sex. We like joking about sex. We like using euphemism, euphen, making up words for sex. <laughs> but having a real, open, honest discussion, we don't. So if I do offend anybody at this point, number one, toughen up. Number two, then blame me. Don't blame BC Abba. You know, nobody censored my talk. Okay, this is my, my gig here. We don't know much about this. We really don't. Okay, there's some research looking at individuals with an intellectual disability in providing instruction in the area of sexuality. But the challenge is that the three components of sexual education are knowledge, values, and social competence. And with the social thing being so important, that research may not be as applicable as we might like it to be. You know, I can have a, an adult with a Down syndrome label who has an IQ in the 60s and an adult with an Asperger syndrome label who has an IQ in the 140s and this guy with Down syndrome is going to understand the social component of human sexuality far better than this guy is. Let me just give you a very quick example. What is, well I'm not even going to test you on this, I'm just going to tell you. The social rule about masturbation is you don't do it in front of people, right? Privacy is the big rule, okay? Client of mine, Asperger syndrome, New Jersey, at one point, closed its only nude beach. Okay? Which, growing up in New Jersey, I will tell you, is a really good thing. Okay? <laughs> but, he came to my office right after that, furious. Like, I cannot believe they did this. They violated my civil rights. I'm going to call the governor. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do all this sort of stuff. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, like, calm down, man. Like, I didn't know you were a nudist. Like, what's the big... He's like, I'm not a nudist. I'm like, well, what's your... He would go into the, and hide in the dunes and see the naked people and masturbate in the dunes. Now, what's the rule about masturbation? Don't do it in public, okay? He hid in the dunes, so he was following the rule, right? Okay? I said, you do know you're the reason they closed the beach, right? Like, that's like, <laughs> that's probably why. And please don't write the governor. Like, do not write the governor at this point. Okay? But he followed the rule, Okay? This is a, an incredibly complex area of which we have very little research, okay? We don't like talking about it, okay? As a matter of fact, you know, you can get pregnant if you, you know, so if you, you know, then you better use a, you know, is that clear? <laughs> That's how we do it, okay? Although we have, there, there's no actual research on this, but there are anecdotal reports galore for individuals with an intellectual disability who were taught condom use using a banana as a stand-in for the penis, and when the opportunity arises to you to, to have intercourse, you know where they put the condom? On the banana. Not because they have an intellectual disability, but because they were taught to do it. Okay? I always think he's going like, this doesn't seem right. But, <laughs> yeah. So working definition, sexuality is an integral part of the personality of everyone. Sexuality is about who you are, not who you do. Okay? 
It's about who you are as a person. That's what it is. So basic need and an aspect of human life. It's not synonymous with sexual intercourse. When I work with families, I say this is about safety and understanding the person. Those are the two most important things. We want to teach how to be safe and how to understand your changing body. The other stuff we can talk about at a different time, but right now, these are the core important things. It's, synonymous with, it's not synonymous with sexual intercourse and thereby influences our thoughts, feelings, actions, and interactions, and thereby our mental and physical health. Sex can mean gender, whether you're male or female. Sex can also mean the physical act of sex. And sexual education really is a lifelong process. Okay, it's not a one-shot deal. Okay. Further complicating definitions. Well, we have four levels of language in sexuality. We have formal, which is vagina. Then we have technical, we get the labia, cervix, clitoris, vulva. Then we have cute, oh, vajayj. I love over. <laughs> like muffin, little man in the I got these all off the internet, by the way. <laughs> Punani, lady parts, etc. And then slang, which I won't say, but and they all mean the same thing, right? Okay? And this is good, but this isn't good. And what does this really mean? And this one means a whole bunch of different things. Okay? <clears throat> so it's like what like like, what do these languages actually, what do these words actually mean? Okay? Well, you know what? Historically, we were so uptight about sexuality and people with developmental disabilities that in both Canada and the U.S., we just outlawed it. Okay? And as a matter of fact, we outlawed sex with a person, with a woman with a developmental disability, not with a man. Okay? And that's because there was a major double standard that men needed sex, women endured sex, especially good women. Okay, good women didn't like sex, and the fact is that men wrote the laws. So that was part of it. All right. Both programs were designed to protect learners with the developmental disability from abuse, but also to eliminate developmental, rep developmental disabilities by restricting reproduction. Now, independent of the ethical and moral issues here, logically, it made no sense. Because most children with developmental disabilities are born to typical parents. So, you know, ethically it was wrong, morally it was wrong, logically it was wrong on every level. But you know what? Until the mid-1960s and actually later, um, such actions remained pretty commonplace. Um, I'm not surprised, though. I mean, if we look at the DSM, it was only in the 70s that we removed homosexuality from the pantheon of psychiatric disorders. You know, up until then it was a diagnostic class. Like, we are not the most enlightened society you know, in terms of diverse sexuality, okay, and we get hung up on all this stuff, so anytime, and the, when I started in the field, people were discussing whether or not masturbation under certain circumstances was an appropriate behavior or an inappropriate behavior necessary to be reduced, you know, like dopey stuff, but this is where the discussions were, okay. Three big myths, these are not your myths, you don't have these myths, you're the chosen people, okay, <laughs> You didn't quite have to cross the desert for 40 years, but you're still the chosen people. All right, myth number, these are the myths that the community has. Myth number one, okay, folks on the spectrum or with other developmental disabilities have little or no interest in sexuality. Okay, I call this the Rain Man myth, that if your only understanding of, of autism spectrum disorders is the movie Rain Man. Temple Brandon, though, writes about that she doesn't see herself as being a sexual being. She doesn't see herself as personally sexual. She doesn't see herself ever Dating, okay? Um, but Jerry Newport, who's on the spectrum, wrote a book about his sexual life. Okay, so this is wrong. Okay, that's just a myth. Myth number two, folks on the spectrum are hypersexual. Because they don't, this is like that of mice and men myth. Because they don't have their, their complete cognitive faculties. If they get aroused, they're going to run amok. And I was at a town meeting once when a, a, a small residential support program was going in. Four adolescents with autism into this one town. And at this meeting, one woman got up and asked, what happens if one of those boys gets an erection? <laughs> the people in the program were like, you want to take this? I don't want to take this. <laughs> Finally, somebody said, well, if it doesn't go down on its own, we'll direct him to his room and he can take care of it. You know, she had no part of that. She, you know, she asked again. They said the same thing. You know, it got pretty ugly. Um, but it was just ignorance. And I mean that in the nicest way. I really do. That she just had no idea. And her version of, of life was if one of these kids got aroused, like, you know, he would start running around in a circle. 
you know, he'd probably whip off his pants because, let's face it, they were only held on with Velcro. Um, you know, jump out the window with an erection, trip over her daughter, impregnate her daughter on the way down, and then bounce right back up, <laughs> and continue impregnating the town in the circular country. Okay? Don't be, right? But remember, the last fashion of acceptable public, acceptable public discrimination, okay? Um, but please also understand that particularly for adults with adolescents and adults with Asperger's syndrome label, if we're not educating them, we are setting them up for some pretty horrific failure. Okay? Uh, uh, court cases that I've done, everything from uh, capital cases to child pornography cases to, like, I, you know, sexual assault cases, like, I can't even begin to tell you some of it. And it's, yes, it's, it's, some of them are real crimes. Like, they knew what they were doing. And, but most of them are like, they just didn't know the rules. They didn't understand. Like, nobody taught them how to do their stuff. A really simple example that didn't really result in much of anything, but a 16-year-old kid, long story short, a girl he had a crush on, bent over one time, top of her bathing suit, they're at the pool. He thought, I'm not supposed to look in her bathing suit, her nipples are exposed. Instead of turning his head away, he put his hand in and tried to pull up her bathing suit. All right, she freaked, called the cops. Cops come, they ask him, did you put your hand in a bathing suit? What's he say? Yes. yes. Would you do it again? What's he say? Yes. Yeah, they don't ask him why, because they think they know why. Why else would a 16-year-old boy put his hand in a bathing suit, right? Now, that was an easy one to actually resolve. Okay, but you can see how, how simple it is to sort of make an error in this particular area of human behavior if you don't have the instruction. And here's the last myth. Folks on the spectrum are solely heterosexual. This is because, I put this up here because when we do deign to even talk about sexuality, it's almost exclusively from a heterosexual point of view. Okay? And if you want to talk about hidden, you know, hidden curriculum, you know the term hidden curriculum? Okay? Hidden curriculum issues within the gay community are different than hidden curriculum issues within the straight community, within like, and if we're not looking at those sort of things, you know, if we say that you can hold hands with your boyfriend, girlfriend, lover, or companion, but we don't bring in that there are some communities where you just should know that, that, that there are people who are going to react negatively to that, like, we're setting kids up, unless we can set up those levels of discrimination, okay? As a matter of fact, there's a group in New York City called GASP, which stands for Gay Asperger Syndrome People, um, and they talk about the difficulty of not fitting into three social cultural worlds. So they said the neurotypical gay community is hard for them to fit in because it's a pretty socially fluent group. The straight neurotypical they don't fit into because they have Asperger's and they're gay, and then the Asperger's community they feel like they're sort of outsiders because they're gay. So that's tough when you're three social cultural groups, you have difficulty fitting in, okay? So this is a big thing um, that we're ignoring. This is also complicated by the fact that unfortunately, um, starting around middle school, for those kids who are fully included on grade level, and um, there are a couple terms that are being used as a pejorative that really aren't in many ways, but they are, but fag, queer, okay, they're used to actually make fun of other kids who are different, okay? And now if you don't know anything about this, and you think, well, they only have one guy friend, and they don't have any girlfriends, and they don't have any, like, it, it lends to issues of gender identification confusion and all this sort of stuff because we're not addressing this issue from any rational point of view because we're afraid of it, okay? It's like any other skill set, okay? Truth is, folks on the spectrum are sexual being, but you know what? Individual interest at different times and across people, it all varies, you know? <coughs> Neurotypical boys, it, when they're four years old, discover their penis, right? And it now becomes their, their best friend in the world for the next 18 months, right? Their hand is never far away from the penis. But then, over the course of those 18 months, like, the social rules start to kick in, and grandma's reminded you enough, and your friends are starting to make fun of you. Okay, so it stops until about, like, 13, and then your penis becomes your best friend again <laughs> until you're, like, 97. But that's a whole different thing. <laughs> that's a different contingency, but you learn the social rules so you don't walk around with your hand on your penis. Okay, because we would if we could. That's the thing. <laughs> Please remember, though, that folks are always going to, independent of what you think about the person, the community is going to judge somebody by their chronological age. Okay? A five-year-old running up and hugging you, you're a little freaked out by it, but you're not calling the cops. 25-year-old, that's a sexual assault. 
Okay? And that's a big problem. When it comes to sexuality, what we don't know? Well, in two recent studies, and by the way, much of the really good sexuality research has come out of Canada. I have to give you guys props for that. So, um, Dorothy Griffiths, actually, um, one of the top people in the field. Dave Hingsberger, um, he doesn't do research, but he writes about it. Um, so, um, and two somewhat in the field, this is somewhat recent studies, Research has concluded that individuals with intellectual disability have lower levels of sexual knowledge and experience in all areas except menstrual care and body part ID. Why? Well, we've got to teach menstrual care since we stop sterilizing people. And body part ID? We beat body part ID into the ground and don't even teach the right body parts. You know? Um, everybody knows the term private parts, right? Right, private parts are those parts of your body that are covered by your clothing, okay? Your name is? Nadine. Nadine. Okay? We know Nadine's private We know Nadine's private parts of those parts of her body covered by her clothing. Can I go down there and stroke her hair? No. Can I take her hand? No. Can I rub her? No. Her body is her private part. So you're taking this kid who has a very concrete understanding of language saying these are your private parts, what's the rest of your body? Public parts. <laughs> Nobody can touch your private parts, what's you say about the rest of your body? Anybody can touch your public parts. Your body is your private. These are more private, but your body is your private part. Okay? <coughs> well, we don't know if it often hurts. Stokes and colleagues basically found when they looked at the social romantic functioning of adults with Asperger's syndrome that they engaged in stalking at higher rates than typical peers. Okay? Which is understandable since that's a socially derived behavior and it gets intimately reinforced, so it's really difficult to change. And by the time I'm introduced to this person, it's so hard to change, okay? This is a big challenge when this happens. Here's Dorothy Griffiths. We have to be proactive in this. Waiting until stuff happens, we're too late, okay? We need to be ahead of the curve if we're going to do this successfully. Here are just some basic guidelines. Think ahead and be proactive. Be concrete. Please don't use euphemisms. Don't get into petals of the flower and birds and the bees and, you know, honey pot or whatever the frick you want to call it. Like, use the right words. If you can't say vagina without blushing, you're not the right person to do this. Okay? Serious, calm, supportive. Test, analyze everything. Um, we are very repetitive with our social, with our safety skills. Um, I have here, what are the practical impl implications and teach all steps in the correct order? There isn't a really good curriculum out there. Um, the curriculum that I like, that I use, is the OWLS curriculum, but it's not written for people with disabilities, which is why I like it. <laughs> it's actually put out by the Unitarian Universalist Church. It's seven volumes. OWLS is our whole lives. When I, when I talk to parents about getting it, I say buy the volume that is before your child's age, your child's age volume, and the one after. So you sort of bracket you get a confidence interval that you're going to know that this is the right stuff that you should be teaching. Okay? Uh, it's, it's, I will caution people, it's very explicit. Um, but it's really good. Like it talks about everything. And it's also not that expensive. But sometimes when we go off on our own and don't think about the consequences, we teach dopey stuff. And this was a case of a young man who one day actually started going up to women and saying, hi, my name is so-and-so, can I touch your breasts? Hi, my name is so-and-so, can I touch your vagina? Hi, my name is John. Like, different body parts he'd go through. Um, eventually, police get involved. Um, then we get involved. Just so you know, in situations like that, the first question you ask is, what sexual, what sexual education has the person had? You want to know what knowledge they have, where they got it, that sort of stuff. Well, he had body part ID, and he had really good body part ID. Like, we liked that. The only other thing he was taught was that if you want to touch a woman, what do you have to do first? Ask. Ask. Okay? Now, you guys do that, right? Yeah. You know what the problem that is? That's the last step in a 247 chain. Okay? There are 267 steps before you get to, can I touch your breasts? Okay? <laughs> Often involving alcohol, but... <laughs> You know, that, that, why was he taught that though? Because it worked in the classroom. He would go to touch his teacher. The teacher would say, you have to ask the woman before you can touch her. He would say, can I touch your arm? She would say, no, and that would be the end of it. You know what the rule is in the classroom? 
You don't touch your teacher. Like, that's, it's not, that's not a community of opportunity to teach. The rule is that you don't touch adult women. <laughs> okay? When you become an adult, we can look at some discrimination training. But right now, this is the rule that we all have to live by. Um, consider using multiple instructional mediums. Um, once again, thanks to Canada, I love um, Degrassi Junior High, the next generation. I use it to teach a lot of my kids about social situations and sexuality. It is a great... You have to like sit through the whole season, which is not the worst thing to do. Um, seriously, to find the good stuff. But like, there's one story cycle about a teacher who, who was hitting on a girl um, and how she sort of dealt with it and her friends cautioned her not to. Because one of the most difficult concepts to teach is that sometimes abuse feels good. Okay? Just because it feels good doesn't mean it's not abusive because there's a power thing. So it gets real. So there's some really good stuff in Degrassi Junior High. Um, for dating skills, just so you know, I use the Jack Nicholson, Helen Hunt movie, As Good As It Gets, because it has these like two really socially inept people with their own challenges trying to get together. and you know, It's a, just a good discussion piece. Okay? You can buy a whole bunch of stuff to teach this, but we don't know what really works. We have these anatomically correct dolls, which I don't know if you can see this, but there are two things of yarn coming out here with little like gingerbread men attached to it. <laughs> because that's where babies come from, I assume. You know? And I'm like, available from your local retailer. Okay? Like, what are you going to teach with this? All right? Um, you know, the stuff that's out there wasn't designed for our, our guys. Um, I do use, to some extent, the Circles. You ever, people know the Circles program? Yeah, I just don't buy the Circles program. Like, it's $2,400. I know this is being taped, but I don't buy I just draw concentric circles on a piece of paper. You know? That's sort of what I do, and I'll show you that. Um, we make our own stuff. Um, homemade digital photos and videos, by the way, not of nudity and private movies. <laughs> just thought I should throw that in. You know, but we, there's a lot of, like, for example, like, we want to teach, we work with families of young kids to, after their tub, because they're that young, we work with teaching them to then put a robe on before they leave and then go out to go to their bedroom. Now, the, that's really a high skill for a little kid. And it's kind of cute when five-year-olds, naked five-year-olds, like, run around. Like, that's kind of cute. But it's not cute when he's 15. So we work with them. And so what we'll show is, like, from behind, putting on the robe, like, walk into your room, and when you get to the room, there's a treat for you. So now you see the sequence, you can establish the sequence. So we'll do stuff like that to try and establish. Um, Google image search. Um, I love, if you remember, in your health you know, books back in high school, like there was that line drawing of the vagina and a line drawing of the penis. Okay? On Google image search, you can actually find an actual photograph of a penis and a vagina that have the same, like, the lines going into it and saying like like clitoris, lobby, menorah, lobby. And for, for the guys we work with, like that's sometimes a better depiction than the line drawings. Um, I just want to show you. These are two photo arrays, and this is sort of the beginning of um, who can help with your menstrual care and who can't. This is just the very first step. This is just picture discrimination. Um, this is really easy. Okay, this is Nancy. And now which one is Nancy? Yeah, I mean, come on. It gets harder as we go on. Okay? That's Nancy. Now which one is Nancy? They're all Nancy. <laughs> Unless you want the person who's supposed to do this to wear the same clothes and the same hair and the same, like, like, we need to actually make sure that we can discriminate the different looks of this person before we can go on. Okay? Here's a final guideline and why this is so important because of these language and communication and concrete challenges that we so often face. Constantia and Lunsky did a study where they showed photographs to adults on the spectrum and asked them what they saw. These are the photographs that they presented and their responses. Okay, so we have this picture here. Okay, and they asked, tell me about this picture. To which the adult replied, people were sitting on the couch being friends. 
Now, not my definition of friends. <laughs> friends with benefits, maybe. But not friends. But now, if this young man's idea that this is friendship, that can be a problem. All right? This one's a little more risque, but it's actually just a Calvin Klein head. So it's not like kids aren't going to be exposed to this. Okay? What does the picture show? Well, you guys have a pretty good idea what the picture shows. What the adult said? Two people lying in a towel. Well, I've yet to find the towel, but <laughs> I can't argue with him. Now, I also don't think he's going to get sexually abused by somebody saying, come on, lie on my towel, you know? But if you don't understand this sort of stimuli, that, again, presents us with a problem. This is my favorite, though, and I'm going to challenge you to tell me why. You guys can see the picture clear. Can you see the picture OK? Yeah, OK. I want you to tell me why he said this. What is the man doing? The hand is somewhere he chopped it off. Because sometimes, folks on the spectrum, notice things that we consider to be irrelevant. Bobby Klim's work on when they're watching the movie, that they're looking at the lips as opposed to the eyes and the face. In this one, where her arm is bent, it's a stub. And so if she doesn't have a hand, the hand has to be somewhere, so that's why the guy is looking over her. Okay? So in this case, it's a cute sort of emotional, you know, but it's a violent now depiction of dismemberment. <laughs> Um, in our last couple minutes, like I said, these are the three things. Okay, accurate information, personal values, and social competence. If you can teach anything, you know, independent toileting, good things, good touch, bad touch. Okay, we touch kids on the spectrum a lot. We touch kids with developmental disabilities a lot. Okay, little kids, we want to make sure that like social touch is important and all this stuff. But as kids get older, we really need to fade that out. Okay? Otherwise, all we're doing is teaching kids that strangers can touch you. Okay? And that's not good. The guy who's dating, I'll show you at the end. Like one of his big, big reinforcers was bear hugs. And this is a really aggressive, really big adolescent. So we said, okay, it really works for him, but the only person who can hug him is me. Like, because I don't want him thinking he can get a hug from anybody, and especially from some woman in the community. Like, so we had to really discriminate, okay, that this is what it is. Um, proper names of body parts, please, 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 like, use the right terms. Don't teach kids to say, like, pee pee or woo woo. Like, use the right terms, you know, and if kids repeat the right terms, I think that's, you want to infantilize an adult male, get him to say pee pee. You want people to think he's a little kid in a big body, that's your fastest way. Okay. This, by the way, we start in elementary school teaching menstrual care. Why? Because every decade, the age at which a young girl gets her first period drops down lower. And although, as I said before, I've never had a menstrual cycle, I would tend to think that the first time you get your period is not a teachable moment. Okay? <laughs> Yet yeah, that is what we do, okay? And if you, I actually took the slide out for this one, but um, Megan has schedules set up where like if I wear my panty liner for 15 minutes, I get to watch Ariel the Mermaid because we're starting with kids that young to get them to wear this thing. And because it's uncomfortable, it's not, I'm assuming. Like I don't think like you're looking forward to it, you know? <laughs> but. But waiting until seems to be too late. Okay, it goes on and on and on. The last thing in the area of sexuality I just want to talk about is that, you know, masturbation's cool. Okay? Like, it's just a where or when thing. I go with the Woody Allen line, which is don't knock masturbation, it's sex with someone I love. You know, so it's really just trying to teach the where and when of this. My general rule is your bedroom in your home is really the only appropriate place. Um, I really discourage the use of bathrooms because there's bathrooms everywhere. And masturbating in the bathroom at work gets you fired. Masturbating in the bathroom at the mall gets you arrested. Okay, masturbating in the bathroom at grandma's house just pisses off grandma. <laughs> you know? So the more discriminations we can sort of put in, you know, the better off we're gonna be, okay? Uh, I don't teach masturbation. There are people who can. They are certified in 
you know, sexual education. They have emphasis with developmental disabilities. You can find them through the ASEC website, which is the Association of Sexual Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. Um, only twice in my history have I had to bring somebody in to teach. One was a 34-year-old man who was uh, masturbating with such intensity that he was tearing his penis up space. And the other one was a young woman who sort of similarly, what we think happened is that she had, by rocking on the arm of the couch, she had either approximated or achieved orgasm, and then was unable to approximate that again or achieve orgasm again, and so started to rock harder and faster. And then finally, she was like slamming her body up and down on the arm of the couch, causing tears and bruising um, to the whole vaginal area. So we had to call in somebody to help um, with that. Okay. Um, Values, you got all this sort of stuff. In the, this is some of the stuff that we do in the social area, just so you know, because we talked some stuff about social already. But you know that this, the two people sitting on the couch being friends? This is where we would go to initially. Like, well, let's talk about what friends do. And we'd set up this is what friends do, then we'd also do what friends don't do, then this is what acquaintances do. So we actually do, we could put as many of these bubbles in as we like, or as few. It really depends on the individual. Um, again, here's the, the circles thing, although the colors came out wrong. Okay, but the inner circle is your private circle and so on. With my guys who are more challenged by their disability, um, we tend to use only two circles. We say these people can touch you, these people can't. It's a very simple discrimination at that point, okay? But we have a whole bunch of challenges. I mean, we have discontinued services, dearth of services, limited interest, staffing concerns. Issues with criminal justice system and substance abuse issues. I was talking to a couple of people before. I have guys who get high. I have clients who go and get high. Um, who then, if you get high, you don't have a whole lot of social skills. You end up getting in trouble with the law eventually. But the reason they get high, although they say it calms them down, which makes sense to me, um, it's a really easy social group to be part of. You know, let's face it. Like, a bunch of adolescent stoners is not witty repartee, you know? <laughs> Like it's a, so it gets, once you really get out there, the issues that behavior and honest are going to be asked to address are really challenging. But there's quality of life. What's the rest of your life look like? Is it going to be average or memorable? I want memorable. You know? I really hope for all of you here today. I hope when you're on that park bench, when you're in your 80s, and you're thinking back about your life, I really hope you're thinking about more than your fifth grade birthday party. I hope you're thinking more about, than about your high school graduation or your college graduation. I hope you're thinking about stuff that you've never told anybody, but was really a lot of fun. You know? Stuff you would never tell your kids, but you're really glad you did. Okay? That's what life is about. And we then come back to Denny Reed. And we can address happiness, okay? Life, not life, but good life, is to be chiefly valued. That's really what it's all about, okay? What do we mean by quality of life? Well, AT&T says the key to happiness is cheaper long distance service. But Fruit of the Loom says the key to happiness is nice undies. On the other hand, Pillsbury says, doesn't matter what other people say. You define your quality of life. I don't define your quality of life. You define your quality of life. Robert Shalek's definition, quality of life is a term used to describe a temporal condition of personal satisfaction, so it's time-bound and it's what works for you. And here's the tough part. It's physical well-being. Well, are you physically, are you physically healthy? Emotional well-being. You know, today we didn't have time to even talk about some of the mental health aspects of growing up and those complicating issues. Interpersonal relations and social inclusions. Do you have people that you care about and who care about you in your life. My friend Donna, who said, all you need in your life is one good neurotypical person. She said, no, she said that, that the, if you neurotypical have all the skills, why don't you adapt? She also said, all you need in your life is one good neurotypical friend. And when I asked her why, she said, because two of you are just too hard to understand. <laughs> and that really made sense to me. Um, personal growth, are you challenged on a regular basis? Material well-being, okay, do you have enough money? Not often a problem, like my guys tend not to be concerned. And when they are concerned, they're sort of overly concerned. But it's a very neurotypical thing. Self-determination and individual rights. This is all tough stuff. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
We can attempt to operationally define some of this stuff. We're behavior analysts. We like to operationally define stuff. Well, part of it should be an exclusionary criteria. You know, where, where quality of life is not contradictory to active services. You know, like the fact that I tried for six months to teach him to like other things than Sesame Street videos, I think improved his quality of life because he got to try stuff. I didn't just default to, well, this is his choice and I'm done. It's not without risks. Please understand that I have had more community faux pas than you guys will ever have. I had one guy urinate over an entire can aisle of Campbell soup cans. I had one guy destroy a food court three times. I had like, like stuff that's happened to me, like trust me, isn't gonna happen to you. Just that I, over the course of my, like, I have a bigger risk benefit analysis than most people do. Because I've done it for so long and I know I can control many of the variables along the way. Okay? But it's not without risk. Nor is it about minimal standards. Okay? It's definitely not about accepting less. Oh, and it's not a group measure. This is the one thing that annoys me. About. When the people say the children in our program have this level of quality of life, or the people in our group homes have this, like, no, 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 no. Quality of life is an individual measure. It's not a group measure. It's not defined solely by special events. Um, if you're like me, you get a lot of promotional material from programs out there, and they send you, you know, their like newsletter of the month and all this stuff. I know I got like two minutes. And you find that, okay, they went on a cruise. I'm like, big deal. All that tells me is that you have the time and money to go on a cruise. Like, tell me what Monday's like and I'll be much happier. Well, you know what? We can measure some of this stuff. But if we look at it across the three big parameters, choice, control, and competence, you're going to get all this very quickly. There you go. Um, we actually can start to measure some of this stuff. So we can look. In childhood, you have very simple choices. But as an adult, you have choice over where to work, live, worship, eat, vote, sleep with. You have significant control, and you're pretty competent. And let me just introduce you to him, and then I'll get out of here. After I got my doctorate, I went back to Rutgers and started the community transition program for adolescents with severe autism and a long-standing history of significant challenges in behavior. Um, we defined long-standing history. You had to be kicked out of four of the schools before we would take you in. These were tough, tough, tough guys. Um, this was a positive behavior support antecedent management program. Okay? This is our first student. This is me working with him up to here. This guy broke my nose twice. Okay? Over the course of running this program for three years, I was stabbed, I was knocked unconscious, had my nose broken, multiple bites, bruises, and lacerations, and I wasn't even in the program classrooms every day. <laughs> okay? These were tough, tough guys. This guy, six foot four, 240 pounds, nonverbal, had an old school ACS that was this big but had four icons on it that were like this. And the only way he could use it is if he hit it right in the middle of the icon. And also it was help, eat, drink, and bathroom. Okay? Day one. Oh, by the way, the only way he would use it was to throw it at me. That's the only way he'd use it. <laughs> Day one, 95 aggressions. And this purple line here, these are what we call aggressive episodes. This is when he would really grab me, knock me to the floor, bite me, kick me. Okay. I ended the day sweaty, total clothes torn, bruised, bleeding, um, tired, but really happy. Because if you want to collect data, <laughs> I got 95 data points. <laughs> we found two reasons why he was aggressive. Why he was aggressive. Number one, escape. He wanted to turn it. And he had learned that you can terminate instruction by hitting the teacher before they ask you to do anything. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. Number two, access to tangibles, food. Because he'd been in programs that thought they understood behavior analysis, and they would set up a token program where if he got five tokens, he got a Twizzler. He loved Twizzlers. Okay? If you're this aggressive, do you ever get five tokens? No. So you know what he learned to do? Hit the person who has the Twizzlers and take their Twizzlers. Okay? It was brilliant. Okay? We did two things. Okay? Functional communication training. Now, he's nonverbal. I can't get him to use the ACS without getting my nose broken. Okay? What we reinforced for communication were failed attempts at aggression. So I would walk in, he would jump up to hit me, and before I I went, that's me tell me. <laughs> and I ran away. <laughs> okay? Within an hour, he wouldn't get out of his seat, but he'd swing at me. So I now he'd go, thanks, dude. All right. At the end of the day, we joked he was dismissing me. He was like, eh. 
<laughs> because from response efficiency, how much better was his life? Yeah. Right? Okay? Now, you know the hard part for me? I had to stay in the room when he hit me. Okay? Because I had to make that discrimination between you don't hit me, I'll leave. Hit me, I'm going to stay here. I didn't have to do anything. It was just me staying there. Okay? That wasn't. We also did not contingent reinforcement, just distributed food, normalized food throughout his day. That's all. No, no longer an urn. You can see. Comes down. I switched out here. I guess I'm done. That's okay, because you saw the graph. Okay? But you know, like, those data were publishable and they were published, but you know what? Who cares? Like, if that's all we did, like, it doesn't, we could have gotten better data just by never going in the room. Like, <laughs> like seriously, okay? Well, I just want you to know that in a, a three-year follow-up, we went back and basically found that at that point, um, oops, that he was now supported as an adult for less than a third the cost of our program. We thought that was a positive outcome, okay? He regularly went out to restaurants. This is the guy who trashed the food courts. Because his parents, his, their goal was for them to go out to eat. Okay? Uh, he volunteered at the food bank. He wasn't working yet. But he was volunteering. He was a member of the Alps Club and he was nominated for Elf of the Year and actually was awarded Elf of the Year. Okay? And then last year, I got an email from his mother and it just said, I thought you'd like to see this, uh, the picture of this young man. And when I clicked on the picture, it was this guy holding his six month old niece in his lap. Aww. Yeah, you went, oh, I said, what are you freaking nuts? <laughs> That's the power that you guys have. That is the power that you guys have. To take this guy who nobody wanted to work with. Okay? And over the course of a couple of years, this didn't happen overnight, help transform his life to the point that he could actually hold his niece on his lap. That's what behavior analysis could do. And I thank you all for your kind attention tonight. Peace out.